This meeting is now being called to order. We will go ahead and take call. Roll call. I call this November 8th, 2023 special meeting of the Measure o Oversight Committee to order at 4 p.m. sharp. And Secretary, are you ready for roll call? Mr. Miner? Here. Vice Chair Custom? Here. Member Atkinson? Member Bailey? Here. Member Cosgrove? Member Hinton? Here. Member Holmes? Okay. Let the uh, order reflect that committee members are present with the exception of Member Atkinson, Cosgrove, and Holmes. Okay, housekeeping. Welcome to our committee members and members of the public. Thank you for joining us today in person and via Zoom. Our meeting format is integrated with members of the public watching via Zoom. Members of the public who are using Zoom may view and listen to the meeting. And as a reminder, the meeting is being recorded. The city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe inclusion environment free from disruption and will not tolerate tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is ex expected to participate respectfully, and if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Can you explain? Thank you, Chair Miner. After an agenda item has been presented, the chair will ask the committee members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following their discussion, the chair will open the item for public comment. If you are attending in person and wish to comment, and you, you will be called on when the agenda item is open for public comment. Please raise your hand to indicate that you would like to comment. You will be asked to state your name for the record if you wish. Each public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Any email comments that were received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received are not read into the record. Okay. Item number two, public comment on non-agenda matters. Chair, uh, we are now taking in-person public comments on item two, non-agenda matters. This is the time when any person may address the committee on matters not listed on the agenda, but which are within the subject matter of the jurisdiction. Madam Host. Uh, we have no hands raised at this time. Okay. So we're moving on to item three, approval of our minutes. Seeing, are there any edits or corrections to the minutes of April 20, 2023? I move approval of the minutes as presented. I second it. Okay. And if there are no additional comments, we now approve our minutes and for a submission. Moving on to item 4.1, proposed committee name change. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Connor. I'm the budget and financial analysis manager at the city. I'm also the staff liaison for Measure O. And we had briefly discussed at our previous meeting that the Measure O subcommittee name is possibly up for an overdue name change. Um, measure O is the name of the tax measure originally passed back in 2005, and this was renewed with Measure H in November 2022. So technically, Measure O does not reference the tax measure that's in effect anymore to fund this, um, this, this service. So changing a board name does require council approval. If the subcommittee does agree on a name change, we would bring this to city council on December 5th for them to vote. And after speaking with our city clerk's office, they also recommend that if a name change is put into place, that we follow it with the formerly Measure O title, as that is a name that's widely recognized here in the community. So we spoke to our departments and several people across the city and stakeholders and asked them for recommendations on names. And we have come up with some options for you all to discuss. The first one is to just keep the Measure O Citizens Oversight Committee name. Um, there's no technical or legal requirement saying that the name has to match the tax measure in place. This is a name that's widely recognized. It's synonymous with the public safety and prevention 
revenue that comes in. So if the subcommittee would like to keep the name Measure O Citizen Oversight Committee, that's an option. We could do that. Another option that we heard was the Public Safety and Prevention Tax Citizens Oversight Committee. For short, this would be the PSAP COC. Um, option number three is the Safety Tax Reporting Committee. For short, we would call this the STRC. And then option four, it's a longer one, Public Safety and Wraparound Services Citizens Oversight Committee, which doesn't have an acronym, but is inclusive of everything. So what we would like the committee to do tonight is we're asking you to look at these options, discuss and take a vote. And if you have a recommendation on a name change, we'll bring that to council in next month. Okay. Are there any questions from the committee? I have a comment just that I, I think that some of what we want to be sure we can, or, and I'm guessing you talked to all the departments, it sounds like you did, and that is that it's confusing to people what we're talking about. We say measure O now and measure H and all that. And we, I know for the violence prevention part that there needs to be a, um, a promotion of what we do so the community knows what we're doing. And so I think any of the names that we choose, we need to think in terms of promotion. I'm assuming the fire and police have the same. You want to be able to promote. Now, this is a sales tax. We're so lucky that the community voted for it one more time, right, in large numbers. And so we want to be able to show them all the work that we're doing with their money. And so um, I just want to keep that part in mind. I, I, for me, I, I like the um, Public Safety and Prevention tax, tax Citizens Oversight Committee because it brings in everything. Um, it's kind of cumbersome. All of them feel cumbersome to me, but maybe... Um, but that seems the closest to me to, to what would work for each department. I just have one question, but I'll save everything else for after the public comment. Um, the confusion issue, in addition to what Ellen just said, was there a discussion about potential confusion with the county's measure O and its funding of homeless, some similar but adjacent uh, services to what we have? So yeah, we're aware that the county has a measure O um, which is one of the reasons we sometimes would like to get away from that title. And there could be future measure O's down the road that would cause confusion, future measure H's down the road. So the generic title of a measure isn't always ideal, although this has been the name of this subcommittee for almost 20 years now. So here at the city, it's a very well recognized item, but maybe not countywide necessarily. I, I appreciate it. I have comments, but I'll save them for after public comment. Okay. I, well, I do have, um, that is a mouthful with the different names. And so I do have some recommendation. And I think it's important that you also include the committee because we're also part of that team, which I don't believe we were. And so with that being said, one of the things I'm looking to propose for a name is Prevention and Safety Oversight Committee or Safety and Prevention, whichever one you want to put first, Oversight Committee. That's easy to remember. And it, it, we can get a few acronyms off of that as well that it's not so cumbersome. So those are my recommendations for that. And the- I would just suggest we do a public comment before we discuss the mm -hmm. recommendations. Okay. So any other questions? Okay, any public comment to our gallery here today? Thank you for coming. I am public, so I was hoping. <laughs> 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 oh. Okay, going once. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a more uh, for the community. Obviously, we haven't had people. This would be an opportunity for you to just say which name you prefer. So you don't have to give an eloquent speech or anything. But <laughs> suggestion. Okay. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We won't put anyone on the spot. So go ahead with your comments. Um. I, I, actually, uh, I heard from Ellen, I heard from you, and I, I'd like to hear from the rest of the committee before I, before I weigh in to see if there was other ideas or other options that we're talking about. Just, uh, for me, I'm hoping that this is a uh, deliberate and final decision tonight, um, not a long process. So um, I'm interested to hear if there's other proposals. Yeah, I like the number two, public safety and prevention. Then I will comment. So I also support number two, um, and, and Madam Chair, the specific reason that I support it versus your language, which is very similar, is I think for the public, the fact that we're an oversight committee of the tax 
is an important detail, and I wouldn't want there to be confusion that we're an oversight committee of the program services um, or, or the quality of the services provision. Um, so I would, um, unless someone on my left is going to raise their hand, make a motion to adopt number two uh, as our recommendation to the council. Seconded. Okay. Well, I guess we'll take it to a vote. Well, you can talk after a motion. Yeah, I, I, for me, it's just the cumbersome of the name. And um, but if that is if no one else, you know, actually, my thoughts is how does the the community feel about the name change? Because they're going to have to be able to recognize the name change. And so did for to the staff, did you do any work up on that as far as like the public? Did they give any feedback in relation to that? We did not reach out to the public. This is more of the name kind of serves the purpose of within the organization us being able to have a moniker that we can refer to and title the board. Um, but we did feel we did want to be sensitive to the fact that these names did take into account violence prevention as well as public safety. We didn't want to be one or the other. So it was hard to do that and keep it concise. <laughs> Everything ended up being a little lengthy. Yeah. Well, I... Not so sure. I mean, we can take it to a vote, but I, I still feel like the name is too long, but that's just my opinion. And so if with that, if no yeah, additional I'll, comments, I'll we can. That, Amari, yeah, you got a good point. Uh, if I didn't know, no conversation was done with the community at all. Uh, but obviously that's probably a lot of work, but uh, I like the, the public and safety was a little cleaner is that do you think do you feel like some people would take offense for not having the like the other words in there is that something we could just do right now yeah for sure we were hoping this could be an opportunity for you all to discuss oh, to discuss options, oh, okay. if options were out there if there's yeah. another name that everybody favored instead you certainly don't have to stick with one could you repeat yours again i just have prevention and safety oversight committee yeah that okay. seems pretty simple and sweet. yeah i like that too or safety and prevention whichever you prefer I mean, my sole concern with that would be that without being it clear that we're on the revenue side, I would be worried about confusion and purpose, which is something that our committees um, experienced in the past. Uh, and, you know, I, ultimately this is going to go to the council. So I think there'll be ample opportunity for public exposure outside of what our, our recommendation is. But I think from the perspective of transparency, excluding the tax part of it, um, and that is the focus of our oversight, uh, wouldn't live up to that transparency. Well, the other name didn't have tax in it either, so. Which is why I didn't recommend them. <laughs> 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 so are you saying to leave tax or leave it out? Leave it, because I think it is oh, uh, clearly communicates what our function is within the intent of the ballot measure. But do you feel comfortable with oversight in there or no? It uh, seems like you don't. I feel comfortable with oversight because that's actually from the measure. Okay. Yeah. And That's why I, I think number two, as it is, eloquently describes what we do. It captures violent prevention, fire, police, and our parks and recs and uh, youth the supporting component. Um, it, and it is cumbersome, and that's in part because we're somewhat esoteric and have a very specific role. Okay. So how how is the community feeling about making a proposal. The other option we have, which Alan and I discuss, is tabling this to go and do a little bit more scholarship on it and then come back in January and do a full talking uh, about the uh, name change and bring in other aspects. So is anybody opposed to doing that or you prefer to move forward with a name tonight? I was gonna say, I mean, if we, I feel like I don't know nothing about, I'm not overseeing any taxes, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm just trying to have a conversation with you yeah. about, because I know you're saying like, obviously the percentages are set. So I feel I don't oversee any real, ta anything to do with taxes. Because my understanding is you want to keep the word tax in there, right? Correct. Okay. And you want oversight. I kind of disagree. I don't feel I have any oversight over the taxes 
in you know, in regards to in relation to the percentage breakdown of the taxes. So I would be okay with the pub just the what you just said, uh, Chair, about the coming back in January. Prevention, no, no, just the prevention oh. and safety. Yeah, I I wouldn't want to wait a whole till January just to figure out the name. That seems like way too much. Because we have split a hair here. To listen to. Yeah. Can we move both forward as things that there was support for on the committee for the council to then take action on? Um, these were the two that we kind of coalesced on. You as staff can move it. I would really like to not bring this back in January here because I think the council is the one that needs to weigh in. We can, you know, it's always cleaner to have a recommendation from the committee and then to have the council to act on that recommendation. However, if the, the committee feels strongly about bringing both of them together, uh, we, we can do that. Um, that's, it's, it's really, we're, we're taking direction from the committee on how we want to go. The idea of possibly tabling this item now, I, I understand the concerns about that, but um, it, it gives you an opportunity to more fully discuss it. That, that's why that's on the table. However, uh, uh, you do have a motion uh, right now. Um, I, I think you need to act on the motion before you can you can go to the other yeah. other one or at least ask for a friendly amendment to that if, if my Rosenberg's rules of order are, <laughs> are, are remembering um, either one. Uh, uh, but that's, you know, again, that's that was just a suggestion to the chair that that is an off ramp, you know, given the full agenda that we have tonight. May, may I ask for a vote on my, on my motion? Okay, mm -hmm. and repeat the motion. Uh, option two recommended to the council. Recommend option two to the council, and not Yoda. Um. <laughs> no. Yeah, my line to add, I know you just said, I definitely would agree with the, what you said over there, I didn't see your name on the thing, but uh, with the vote, I do want to say too, just thinking forward when we have to get this repassed to the public. I know most of our literature has been past measure O, you know, and obviously people know about it. So now just thinking in the future, you know, we'll be like advocating for let's pass public safety and prevention tax citizen oversight committee. Or yeah, I mean I think yeah, it may be harder in the future when we try to advertise it. Just throwing that out there too. Wait, so let's vote. Yeah, I'm ready for a vote. Okay, so we're going to vote, but uh, do we do the amendment to on top of this or just a, a vote for that one recommendation? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'm asking for a vote on the motion to make a clean recommendation. If it doesn't pass, then we can entertain another motion. Okay. Because um, I would like to amend to send two names to the council. Um, oh, my second also has to wait on that. So I think we already seconded the motion, so I think we need a vote before. We can do an amendment. But someone has to second her ask for an amendment, and no one's doing that, so it seems like we should take a vote. Yeah, I, I'm asking for the amendment. Right. <laughs> but no one's seconding it. Oh, uh, I can second that. There you go. There we go. Okay. So, so the vote will be moving option two with the second option to city council. It's, uh, we're about to go down the parliament trip here. So technically it's two motions, I believe. First we have to vote on the amendment to add the second option, and then we would vote on whatever the results of that are. Um, so we don't automatically adopt the amendment unless it's without objection. And I, at this point I'm, Objecting is, I think, a clean. Um, so you're objecting to. I think a clean proposal is better, mm -hmm. and so I'd like a separate vote on the amendment first. Then we can do the. Then we can do whatever the result of that is. So you want to add the second, do the second amendment first, vote on the second amendment. Will we amend it first? So. Um, 
I wish there was someone other than me that was a parliamentarian here. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Motion on the floor right now. Yes. Yes. And then there's a motion to amend. To amend. So if you have a current motion on the floor, um, has that been seconded? Yes. yes. And someone asked for a friendly amendment? Yes. But have y'all decided on the amendment? It was not it was second. From, the, was, the amendment was second. So now you have to vote on the motion with the amendment. It, you voted the amendment amendment. wasn't friendly. I don't think it matters if it's friendly. If it's second, it was second, then it was second. So then we vote on the amendment, and then we ha and then the results of that get voted on. Yes. So right now you're voting on the original motion with the amendment, mm -hmm. and you're going to vote that up or down right now. Sounds good. And then after that, you can consider the second motion. Okay. So we're making a, a motion to approve with amendment, right? We're making a motion to approve the amendment to add two names to the recommendation. Okay. So we're making a motion to approve the amendment to move two names to the city council. So we need to vote. Starting, with, can you do roll call? Yes. Chair Minor. Yes. Vice Chair Kesson. No. Member Atkinson. Member Bailey. No. Member Cosgrove. No. Member Hinton. Yes. Home. No. Okay, the motion passes. So now we have to vote. So now we do the, uh, with the, the original motion. motion. The well, motion this is the original motion. So now we make a motion to approve the recommendation to City Council on option two. Roll call. We're making a motion to approve option two for city council's approval. Chair Meyer? No. Vice Chair Kesson? Yes. Member Atkinson? Member Bailey? Yes. Member Cosgrove? Yes. Member Hinnon? No. And Member Holmes? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. And let the records reflect the nays and yays. Okay. Okay. Okay, moving on to item 4.2 proposed implementation plan change. Thank you, still me, Veronica Connor. Um, back at the April 20th meeting when we met last, we brought forward an implementation plan that has been our implementation plan for the last several years, which was in a 10 year format. And the committee at that time expressed that this was no longer serving the purposes of our um, financial planning due to the fact that this measure had been passed for another 20 years. So a sample, so the Measure O implementation plan historically was only one year from 2005 at its inception up to 2016. It had been changed to a 10-year plan to account for the winding down of the measure, but with its extension, um, it became apparent that perhaps the one-year plan was a better method to move forward with for the time being. So we have attached to the agenda a sample one-year implementation plan that we would like to use going forward, and we are hoping the committee can vote on approving this. We will need city council's final approval also at the December 5th meeting, but as long as it is recommended by the board, we can bring it to them. Okay, are there any questions? I just have one question. Um, for context, a, a part of this was because there's policy decisions that are being made actively at the council level and us looking at the tenure was outside of our scope. Um, could, could you just talk about what's happened with the public safety subcommittee of the council and and that to just give some context as to why we're making this change. Right, so uh, 
strategy, formal here. Um, thank you, Vice Chair. Alan Alton, Chief Financial Officer. So uh, back in, I think it was, what, 2015, 2016. Um, uh, again, like Veronica said, we, uh, we were nearing the end of that. The, uh, um, there was an interest to show how we would uh, wrap down the, not only the, the, the uses, but the fund balance. So it stopped being more of an implementation plan based off of permissible uses and became more of, um, I wouldn't say a forecasting tool, but at least a, a financial tool showing the, um, uh, the reduction of fund balance and that over time. Um, we're not in that same environment, so it seems that it would be uh, uh, good to go back to showing what uh, the the uh, what is part of the program's budget as it relates to the permissible uses, uh, which is what you see on the single year example that um, I think it went out to you, and it still shows fund balance amount. So it basically gives you all of the information that you had, but you have it on a single year format and you don't have to worry about supposed changes that may be in the future. And to your point, those are more from a, uh, that's something that the council may want to have weigh in on as a policy matter for here. What you're worried about is, is how much funds that you have to, uh, uh, um, to fund the program for the given budget year that you have and do those uh, uh, uses fit within the permissible uses of the ordinance. Thank you. And, and just for context, it's my understanding that the public safety subcommittees of the council has actually started to engage in some of those conversations with the departments. I, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I can, uh, John Craig and our chief of police. So that was on our last in October meeting. We did, that was one of our agendized items. Uh, and we, and we're getting feedback and what we reported out, my chief Westrope and uh, our manager, uh, Daniel Gardunio, we each reported out on what we're doing and how we're using these funds uh, that raise more awareness to council. And that was just this past October. Thank you. I appreciate the context. We're not trying to remove the transparencies, just the transparencies with the council's committee and the council's budget process and and that's why we're focusing back on, on our one year. Thank you. Are there any additional comments or questions? I actually like the format. It's much better. It's clean. So I, I appreciate that. Um, are there any comments, public comments? Oh, I had a quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I know the implementation plan is it's not as clear as the last ones. Uh, well, like you, uh, Chief, how you was talking about it sounds like you probably already discussed it further with like the actual city council and stuff. I just, I noticed on the, this is like the implementation plan that you said this in the agenda. Okay. Cause I've seen like outside services and it said 155,000. Uh, is that so you could elaborate on it? You probably already did it at the, I don't know if it's, it's Those, that's just a sample. Test, yeah, right? Just a sample. This is, yeah, the actual budget that will be proposed. We'll bring that back in the spring to discuss in detail. This is just a sample so you can see the format. Oh, okay. It's one year and where these are just placeholder numbers and categories. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? No, I think it's a, I like it too. It's clear. And if we ever need to project out two or three years for some reason, you know, the fire department needs to do that because I know you're building buildings, um, then we can do that also. Is that right? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And one more time, is there any public comment? Is there any? Okay. All right. With that, uh, at this time, we... This is not an action on it. No, okay. I think it is. Well, we do need a vote on this one. That we, we do need to vote. Okay. Recommend to council. Yes. Okay. Is I, I will move. Uh, I will move adoption of the or recommendation of the new budget template uh, to council. And, Seconded. Okay. Call for vote. Chair Meyer. Yes. Chair Hassan. Aye. <clears throat> Member Atkinson. Member Bailey? Yes. 
Member Cosgrove? Yes. Member Kinney? Yes. Member Holmes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. May I ask, a, I want to ask you a question. With this implementation plan, just like with this one pager, is this something that they would present to us or is this? That the departments would present to, yes. Yeah. So typically the departments will present this every spring after our budget is put together before it's passed. Yeah. They take the opportunity to present this to the subcommittee and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and get more detail. If the subcommittee are you referring to us? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, of course. So you'll have the opportunity to, to ask questions and learn more about it before it goes to council to be voted on. Okay. Okay. And so, and that's the that's the difference that I think I may have missed. So out. that's the, always the way we've done it in the past. The difference yeah. is now we have a one year plan where in the past always that first year was what was being voted on, but then we would have the following nine years that were just estimates okay. or a planning tool, or nine years, and then it would count down as we got closer to the end. We don't have those out years anymore because okay. twenty years down the road, it's just not um, not okay. beneficial to be planning in that okay. capacity. So. Okay, cool. Okay, that makes it. I know last meeting, yeah, I remember, so, uh, remember I had a question about like the percentage increase due to inflation. Right. And all that. So, so we did so away with all that. So oh, that's great. We're focusing it on okay. one year now. So it's what okay. one year will be the budget that will be passed if it's recommended. Okay. Cool. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Moving on to item 4.3, uh, our 2023 annual report. We're going to be starting with the police. All right, thank you. So I'm John Cregan, our Chief of Police, and I have with me our Administrative Service Officer, Pam Lawrence, who manages our budget at the Police Department. So we're going to start this presentation with our ASO. Lawrence is going to go through our first three slides. If we could. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you could advance one more, please. Okay, this shows our beginning fund balance of $1.9 million. Um, we had revenues this past year of $4.8 million, a little bit of interest of $7,400. Um, our expenditures were 3.9 million, leaving an ending balance of 2.8 million. Next slide, please. This shows where those expenses or our expenditures happened. Um, the biggest portion is in our salaries and benefits for our 16 employees funded by Major O. H. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, our services and supplies is the next line. That's three hundred and eighty-eight thousand. This includes one hundred and fifty-five thousand for our Axon fleet and car um, ALPR readers, license plate readers. Um, also, our maintenance for our vehicles, and there are two motorcycles in there, and our replacement fund for those vehicles and fuel. And then we also have a downtown enforcement team um, substation that's in the transit mall um, that's also funded out of here. You see a little slice of that um, pie of 1%, that's about 44,000. That's for the documents related to our purchase of the Rosa Library, which actually happened um, this current fiscal year. Next slide, please. This chart shows our revenue and expenditures since the inception of Measure H. Um, and you can see year over year, our expenditures have outpaced our revenue. Last year, there was a slight dip um, in our expenditures, a reduction due to elimination of three officers, and it's um, increasing again this year. And we anticipate that it'll continue to increase year over year, and it will, um, it's anticipated that it will continue to outpace our revenues. And it's, it's unknown what's going to be happening this year. As you all know, we're in contract negotiations, so we need to keep a little bit of our fund reserve balance for that. <coughs> um, the economy, um, we're not sure what our revenues will look like. So we're trying to maintain a balance in our um, portfolio of about 500,000 to, to um, make up that difference. Great. Next slide. And now we'll go to, as uh, ASO Lawrence explained, that the lion's share of our budget for Metro is going to these positions. And this fiscal year that we're talking about here, we had 16 uh, positions, and it outlines in the slide of those, of 11 of those being sworn officer positions, and uh, five of those being our civilian staff members. And for our sworn, we have the lieutenant position. That's an important position for us that oversees our traffic division, our downtown enforcement uh, team, and all of our special events. And, and that's with the dozens of events that are at the <laughs> Sonoma County Fairgrounds and other events like the 
the Santa Rosa Marathon and uh, literally uh, the host of events that are, and manages those. And we've seen an increase of some of the, of the work that we need to do of making sure there's safety, uh, worried about any uh, active shooter threats and things like that. And that lieutenant goes to the expertise and the training to be able to manage all those large events like the country summer event that brings thousands of people uh, to the fairgrounds. And so that's been an important one for us. We also have one sergeant position there, and that's our downtown enforcement uh, team. And we've talked a lot about that with this subcommittee before about what an important thing that is. And really said it one of our, prioritize, our priorities is making sure that we have a safe and vibrant downtown. It matches with our city council goals that we have here in Santa Rosa. So that's really being an emphasis uh, of that. And then we have nine of the police officers and those police officers are dedicated five to patrol being uniform patrol officers. They're going out and doing seeing some of the enhancements that we don't have of being able to help of driving down our response time to priority calls, helping us during fire season with evacuations and other really important things. And also helping with one of our refocuses on community engagement throughout our city and giving us the ability for officers to get out of their cars. And we really had a focus on being more visible with foot patrols and visible downtown with uh, parks throughout the city, with shopping centers and getting out of the cars and engaging and getting to know our community and being more available to our community. So five are dedicated to patrol, two are dedicated to our traffic team. Uh, in 2022, we saw a high of eight fatal collisions throughout the city of Santa Rosa, that in, in dozens of uh, serious injuries and hundreds of other collisions. Uh, so we've really been focusing with our traffic team and we're, we've seen great progress with that team. And so far in 2023, as we near the end of this year, we've only had two fatal collisions. So we saw a significant decrease in that and the measure was able to enhance that ability by having those additional officers dedicated to our traffic. And the last two of our uh, nine a uh, sworn position goes to our downtown enforcement team. And that talks about the emphasis I've had with that sergeant of being more visible. We're doing things just like even this last Friday night of going out there and they're doing nighttime operations in the evening to make sure when people are coming down and visiting restaurants and our businesses downtown, that they see visible our officers. There's a sense of safety and that addressing any of the concerns. And we've seen some uh, recent issues in our parking garages. So we really had an emphasis on the parking garages, on our transit mall to make sure that people can park there, they feel safe and comfortable and make sure they're not coming back to a broken window with their uh, whatever they just were shopping sold out of the backseat of their car. So those are barely some of the enhancements that those nine positions are able uh, to do uh, in our officer position. And then our civilian positions are equally important. And one of the things we have is our first two are for our field evidence techs. And the field evidence techs are some of the hardest workers that we have in the department. And they process every single crime scene that we have in Santa Rosa. So last year in uh, 2022, we had 12 homicides uh, in the city of Santa Rosa. We had 421 shootings reported to the city of Santa Rosa. So each one of those, those field evidence technicians have the expertise to go out and process those scenes and, they, and they're taking photos and video. They're taking DNA evidence. We have a crime lab that they're able to process fingerprints and DNA. And so those field evidence technicians, and they really have the expertise to be able to go to court and to provide that expertise to make sure that suspects that are facing criminal trials have a, a very fair process and to making sure that we're providing the best evidence from those cases and for the victims in these cases. Our community service officer, we have one position, and that's a great position too that goes out and is able to help to take like non-injury collision reports, non-suspect uh, burglary reports, and it's able to allow free officers to be able to go to more priority calls and calls where there's someone that's calling 911. So that CSO position has been really important and really be an enhancement to our patrol services. Our communication supervisor, and that's for our 911 dispatch center. And one of the stats we have later talks that in 2022, we had over 246,000 calls that came into our 911 dispatch center here in Santa Rosa. So that is one very busy team. And during the major events, when we have wildfires or other catastrophes coming, or the sideshows and other significant events, it overwhelms that 911 dispatch center. So having these supervisors are able to manage that, making sure that we're providing the best level of service to our community. Uh, and so that supervisor position has really been important for us. And then the police technician, and one of the, the, the most overwhelmed teams that we have is our police technicians, and they manage our records division for so the thousands of police reports that are generated and then citations, and they take the police reports themselves when people come into the front counter for missing persons and stolen vehicles and stolen license plates and other things people are turning in. Uh, found property and things like that they handle right there. So it's really an important team. They also help manage our sex registrants, uh, people coming in and they, and, they, and they do some of the initial sex registrant uh, compliance. So they're a very busy team and we were able to have one person dedicated there uh, through the Measure O funds. If we go to our next slide. 
This is some of the other enhancements we've done to our patrol. So ASO Lawrence mentioned, and that's that 155,000 that you were asking about for the outside services. This is for fleet, but we're the first in Sonoma County to have every single one of our VARC patrol vehicles now has three cameras in them uh, like that. So we all wear the body-worn cameras, but what we've seen is the body-worn cameras can be rather limiting in what the view is and sometimes, and so they're not really telling the whole picture. So there were three primary uh, attributes that we wanted to put with the Axon cameras. And that's for the first one is accountability, that we wanna make sure what we're seeing from our officers, that they're meeting the standards uh, for the Santa Rosa Police Department and what our community expects. And if we see things that don't meet our standards, then we could hold them accountable. The second one is transparency to our community, that so many times for things we saw really limiting views like I talked about. So now the front of the vehicle has a 270 degree angle that goes out the things like that. So it can see almost the whole front going all the way to the side. And and there's a camera inside the vehicle. So anyone who gets transported in our police cars to jail, to if they're just getting transported to the hospital, wherever it may be, we have video and audio in there. Like, so everything's recorded. If there's any uh, concerns that come up, we're able to quickly see that. And it's really been a great tool for us to whether there's some training we can do. And then the third one is just the liability. It's an important one for the city. If any of our vehicles are involved in police pursuits, collisions, uh, any type of uh, other use of force actions, we have a very clear view of exactly what happened is helping. And, and thankfully, the majority of the time, our officers are doing an excellent job in those. And so it helps reduce our liability by having a clear picture of what's seen. So that's been a significant investment and something that we would not have seen without the enhancement of these funds to the police department. And it's helping also for us to lead the way for other law enforcement agencies here in Sonoma County to be able to adopt some of this same technology. The other, I've already talked about, about the enhanced patrol services of having the five extra and the four uh, that are put in those dedicated teams of DET and to traffic. We talked about some of the in traffic safety, and that's something that we're continuing to work on. One of the things that I'm the most proud to talk about in our accomplishments this last year is the efforts on sideshows. And in 2020, 2021, and into 2022, we were seeing sideshows almost every weekend in Santa Rosa, and it was very frustrating to our community, it was frightening to our community. We were seeing acts of violence at these sideshows with individuals getting struck by vehicles spinning donuts, uh, firearm violence breaking out at these, fights breaking out at, and uh, we really came together as a community uh, of the community coming together, our city council coming together and passing a sideshow ordinance. And we really reorganized our countywide response to sideshows. And so far in 2023, we've only had one sideshow and they've shut that sideshow down within a few minutes. And so I can't believe we had the one or we could have had a perfect year, uh, but we're really gonna continue into 2024 of uh, being able to show that we're not gonna tolerate the sideshows here in Santa Rosa. And these funds from this tax were able to help us to be able to officers with our traffic and a patrol to be able to reduce that. The same thing with the proliferation of ghost guns and these per, uh, personally manufactured firearms that we saw in 2022, 236 illegal firearms seized off the streets of Santa Rosa, 74 of those were ghost mm -hmm. guns. And that's something that we're continuing to use these resources. One of the things that uh, we've really been focusing on is our collaboration with the Violence Prevention Partnership. And Danielle Garduño and I and Jeff Tibbetts, we talk so regularly about what with Rec and Park and with the partnership. Anytime we have a major significant violent crime, within hours, I'm texting Danielle, we're talking about how that we can work together with some of the resources. And we're really working toward getting our officers about referring more people to the Violence Prevention Partnership. And that connection is so important to us. And we've said a thousand times in these presentations, we're never gonna arrest our way out of these problems. And we'll have to start working on some of the deep rooted issues and why are kids joining gangs and why are kids getting access to these firearms and why are we seeing some of the violence on our school campuses and the Violence Venture Partnership has been a crucial partner in that. And we're really working toward continuing that relationship. We go to our next slide, please. This one is community engagement. And I outlined eight different priorities that we have for our department. And one of is community engagement that we want our officers, we want our civilian staff getting out of the cars, getting out in the community. We've literally had dozens of events over this, this fiscal year from tacos with a cop, ice cream with a cop, coffee with a cop, so many things like that. Whatever you're eating or drinking in Santa Rosa, we're gonna be there to join you uh, with it. Uh, so uh, just recently, someone was talking to me about they wanna do churros with the chief. So I said, let's do it uh, like that. So we'll, we'll do them all and like that. But that's really been one of our focuses. Our department gets so excited about it. Our officers are able to get our community. I try to go to as many of these events as I can myself. And it's been really just a, like a positive time in our community as we rebuild some of the trust here in Santa Rosa with our community. We get to know our community more. And it's also an awesome opportunity for me and our other leaders to be able to learn like what can we be doing better as a police department and be able to 
to serve our community. And it's really been able to strengthen some of our policies and our procedures by the feedback that we're getting at these community engagement events. Next slide, please. Uh, this we talked about goes over some of our response time. Some of the important one that we get questions about is our priority one response time. We're still hovering higher than I want to be able to see it at seven minutes and seven seconds average the priority one. And that's the 911 call like I need someone here now. Uh, so our goal is to be able to get that under six minutes. And I still think we clearly have some work to do in that area. We've really made strides toward improving some of our staffing. And I think that right now we still have quite a few officers in training, but I think in early 2024, we're going to have a significant amount of officers off training and we're going to be able to start driving down that priority one response team time. What you saw here, the two key numbers I'll pull out is just the 246,000 calls into the 911 dispatch center and just over 108,000 times an officer actually responded to the call and contacted a community member. So quite a bit of calls for service and we're seeing that creep up this year and I expect it to be higher for the 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, this goes over some of the violence that I've already talked about. In 2022, we saw the 12 homicides. We've seen uh, a wide array of robberies and, and um, some of the other things. We're all really positive this year with some of the help from these funds. We've seen a reduction. Our shootings are down 13% uh, this year. We've seen a reduction in robberies, but clearly we still have a way to go in that. And uh, quite frankly, the city of Santa Rosa is changing as we grow and as there's been a lot of changes across the board that we're seeing more violence in our community, more access to firearms, and it's something that we're really putting some additional resources in to see what we can do to curb some of that violence on the streets of Santa Rosa. Next slide, please. So now I'd just love to hear any questions that we have about uh, not only diving deep into the numbers and, and ASO Lawrence is able to really talently answer those questions. And if you have any questions about the direction of the department or how we're utilizing the funds from our special tax here, I'd love to hear those questions. Just a small one. Okay. <laughs> and so in, re, uh, in relation to the reduction in um, the increased number for the average response time, uh -huh. have you seen any changes this year so far in relation to last year? We are seeing, I don't have the exact number with me right now, sorry I didn't bring it with me, but we are seeing improvement of slowly creeping down to the, lo to the lower sevens, but it's still not in the sixes is where we need to be. So we're seeing, uh, but we had just, uh, we've hired in July of 2022, we were down 21 police officers that we had vacant right now. As of today, we have we just had another officer retire this week, so we have three vacancies right now, but we have five lateral officers in background for those positions. So my hope is by the end of this year that we're gonna have all positions filled within the police department, all sworn positions, and we're doing some still testing for some other civilian positions. So, but for us, it's a 20 week academy they go to and another 23 weeks internal training. So it takes about 43 to 47 weeks before they're off training. So for me, it's getting those officers hired, but we hired 14 lateral officers from other agencies across the Bay Area this year. And those are tremendous because they bring the years of experience with them and they're able to go through our training program so much quicker. So that's what we're really focusing on, on those lateral officers that bring that experience. And I think that's what's gonna drive down this numbers. And we're projected right now for our January rotation where we rotate our patrol officers to be able to be back at our max staffing and patrol and start filling some of these specialty teams. So I'm, I'm really hopeful to, for 2024 to start seeing some significant differences with that priority one response times. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, what is the number for like a fully staffed team everyone you're supposed to have? So for sworn officers, we have 184 full-time employee positions and civilians, we have 80. So a total of 264 with department-wide. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Well, first off, you know, definitely got to give it up to you. I've seen you in a lot of places, especially, you know, that, you know, <laughs> the violence prevention partnership y'all been doing. This. So just, just out of this world job, you know, and uh, it's, it's, you know, much, much respect and admiration for, like, you know, what y'all have been putting for our city. Because, as you know, unfortunately, like, the violence, a lot of it, you know, gang involved has been really terrible for our community. And, uh, I definitely, you know, want to give you your your uh, kudos for that, whatever it's called. But uh, to my question, I do want to say is I haven't seen you in a lot of places, you know, uh -huh. and especially with this measure, as we know, measure H, which, you know, came along, you know, for gang prevention and intervention, which, you know, I always, I always harp on. So I want to ask, since this measure does help fund 16, like, positions, I want to ask, how many 
of your officers have participated in these gang prevention activities that you know has been putting on so that, that's one of my questions mm -hmm. and then another one is because i've asked this before so i just want to ask how much of an increase on the foot patrol or bicycle patrol would you say is has increased since the last time you know because obviously i know permissible uses have been altered with this so mm -hmm. hopefully there's a little more leeway you know yeah. on your end so i definitely want to figure out how much of that and then also Back to the permissible uses. I know now you have the freedom to use them on gang enforcement, school resource services, mm -hmm. and then bicycle patrol again. So I want to ask, yeah. how, what would you say from your officers is being done in along these lines? Okay, it's kind of confusing, but yeah. Right. And, well, I, and I can repeat them. You can go one by one. We'll break it down. So for the first one, you were saying you're seeing me a lot of the events, but not so much the officers. Yes, like that. So specifically funded by this. Yeah. yeah. So we. So I do, and I think that's part of my role as chief of police to be out there. Yeah. But we. But I. But we're always bringing a team of officers, and so like so, uh, the tacos with a cop and things like that. We we'll have twelve to fifteen members that are out there at those events, and I'll be out there shaking hands and things like that. But the officers are there. It's really important because I don't want it just to be me. I want the officers to be able to connect with the community. I think it's really important to the culture of our organization. So we always bring a team and, and we try to do a mix of both sworn and civilian and be able to do it some supervisors, some not supervisors. So that's really important. Now it is talking about the capacity of each other because sometimes I can't take people off the streets because I need to go to calls. So sometimes we utilize overtime for that. Sometimes we have volunteers who are to come on that. But we really have been trying to do a mix of it. Sometimes like the public meetings that I might be more the one to go through that. But the community engagement events like coffee with a cop, ice cream with a cop, or other community engagement, we do a lot here at Courthouse Square, different events <laughs> and things like that. Then we try to be around a team. And sometimes those are direct measure O funds or measure H funds and things like that. Sometimes it's just officers throughout the department, but it still is supplemented. Like some of that wouldn't be possible without these 11 sworn officers and the, and the five civilians like that. So sometimes they're able to fill positions. So those in the street are able to go to the event. So it really has a direct connect that all comes back to here that without a doubt, we're able to be more engaged in our community with due to the support from this tax. I think that's really important. For the second question about how much is increasing like foot patrol and bicycle patrol, I think kind of the same applies that by having these additional services and patrol or resources and patrol, it allows them and we, and we, we, the officers laugh about it like that. They talk about like, I try to, I'll stop here for coffee in the morning. I always do like a loop downtown and kind of walk through and I'll see officers walk and they'll kind of say hi to me. And so we're really putting the focus on that of like park your car, get out of there. Now, sometimes it's difficult because as you see that they're, they're going to call after call after call. So it makes it difficult who has been exceptional about this is our downtown enforcement team, which is directly funded by here, has really made a difference of being super visible. I've heard loudly from our downtown action organization, uh, from our local merchants about how much they're appreciating that presence. And a perfect example is that I just talked to Mark Allen Jewelers, who's right here across the street, and he's been at that location for 33 years. And he was just talking to me about, in 33 years, he's never seen such a visible presence downtown and seeing some of the impacts. And I really took that as a, a compliment to the work that's doing done throughout the city of Santa Rosa. And the same with our uh, community and housing services and so many other key partners, the partnership, who have been part of doing that. What was the third question? Uh, that you had on there. So I know one of the permissible uses with this is gang prevention, oh, yeah. school resource services. Yeah. So have you seen any increases in that sector with this new freedom? Well, with the new funding we put for this next fiscal year, we did add that gang sergeant position that uh, that we wanted before like that. So we're still working toward that as my staffing comes back up about being able to build a gang crime team. But like what's really important to me right now is building a gang crime team that meets the expectation of the community. And I've heard a lot from the community on this topic. Uh, so that's something that I want to really build like a team that works, that's focused not just on enforcement and not being a street level team, but it's really focused on there is a time for enforcement with this team, but also heavily focused on prevention, intervention and education. And the perfect time is we had one of the members who's, who's part of our team uh, this week at the uh, Danielle and the Violence Prevention Partnerships uh, gang seminar, like they just had this week in the Violence Prevention Seminar, talking about gang trends. And the goal of that is to be able to educate our community of parents, of teachers, of others, so they recognize some of the signs and that they can intervene in a child's life before they end up in some type of in being introduced to the criminal justice system. So that's where that team's gonna be work. 
the SRO topic is still a really complex topic that we're working with our school board and we're working with our city leaders are looking about how we can increase um, community safety and be able to utilize some of the funds, uh, both from the schools and from the city. So we're having a lot of conversations on that thing, but quite frankly, we still have a little ways to go. Cool, thank you for your answer. Absolutely. Any other questions? Oh, um, I'll, I'll ask my uh, more strategy question. I have a couple of um, financial statement questions. Uh, Sebastopol Station, um, can you give us, so there's money in the, this expenditure plan that's shown in here for, uh, for, this, for the Sebastopol Road Station. Um, uh, can you just give us an update on which property was bought, what the timeline is, and kind of where that happened? Yeah, absolutely. So we, and we talked a little bit before with the subcommittee about this before, but we were really excited. One of our priorities is having a more visible presence in the Roseland community, and then also helping reduce some of our response times in the Roseland community. That like We often have officers driving all the way back to Sonoma Avenue to book evidence, to be able to write reports and do things, and it delays getting back across to the town. So we worked with Jill Scott, our city realtor, and like we literally walked up and down Sebastopol Road with our city. Council member Eddie Alvarez was a key partner in that with us. And we walked around and we looked at dozens of different site or locations. We ended up settling on the Roseland Library being the perfect spot that they had done some significant enhancements. And the Roseland Library had a plan to move out of that. They would vacate that building as we build the Hearn Community Hub. Um, so we worked with that and, and they were renting that location from another thing. So that <coughs> building happened to go on the market market. Uh, we were able to do some great. It went on the market for just, I believe it was 2.6 million. Our Jill Scott was able to work with them and we negotiated down to 2.2 million. So we used all measure of funds to buy that for $2.2 million. But what was really important to me is it's important for Roseland to have a library and we didn't want to evict them from the library until the new space was there. So we came up with a great compromise is that we continued their existing lease. So we didn't raise the rent. Their existing lease, I believe was $9,400. So $9,400 a month. Month, they're doing that and they're paying, but that money is all going back to Measure O because that's where this money came from. So each month until they're able to get into the Hearn Community Hub, we have $9,400 that's coming back. What we are doing is temporarily, and we're in the final negotiations right now, of a temporary substation that we're going to lease on Sebastopol Road until we can move into the Rosen Library. So we're finalizing that now. I don't have all the details on that because we're still in the negotiation phase with that. Uh, we believe we have one picked, and then we're going to be able to lease that one uh, until we move in permanently into the library. And the library substation, we're going to call that our Roseland substation. Our vision is to have that open to the public where we could have police technicians there. You could come in and file reports. We'd have both uh, Spanish speaking uh, uh, staff there. We'd be able to focus on having bilingual material there for people to file reports. And that's really our vision. And then to really be more present there in that Rosen community and our whole west side of Santa Rosa. So big progress in that with us being able to lock in that building, get this lease locked in. And then now we're all anxious to get that Hearn Community Hub built as soon as possible. <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to hear that a few times. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, on the more technical side, uh, the I mean, I'm in the report, not the PowerPoint. Um, on the line item for fuel vehicle repair and replacement, um, there was a, a, a steady increase if you look at it over the last three years, but a pretty big jump year over year. Um, and, and so if you could just explain what the change and difference was there, and then you can also specifically address the word replacement and where these vehicles are serving and who's driving them. Um, so I'll address the money. Um, so the biggest increase is that 155000 for our Axon fleet cameras. Mm -hmm. That's in that line item. That's why the big jump. Um, there's also an a increase in our replacement cost of about um, about, about uh, 15%, and our maintenance cost went up about 7.5% year over year. Um, we have our on-site um, fleet who does that uh, maintenance at the yard. Um, and fuel costs, they've gone up everywhere. So um, I... We doubled our request for fuel. Um, I think it's going to be even more than that, but um, we'll take a spot. So that's that big line item there. Um, and the maintenance or the replacement you were asking, what that replacement means, it's it's like a savings account that we're um, using to put money into to save up to replace those vehicles that, when they're at the end of their life. So the money comes from Measure O year over year and goes to that account, and that account is not a part of our reporter or... Uh, that's correct. Okay. So. But it's earmarked, and it can only be spent on those vehicles. And those vehicles are specifically for? 
Yeah, that's an important issue, that, or the distinction to put. Those vehicles are not just regular vehicles for the fleet. Those are specifically for Measure O funded positions to be able to drive those vehicles to do their job. Thank you. Those are my questions. Okay, anyone else? Okay, moving on. I just have a quick question. Um, are your officers assigned to like specific precincts within the city or like if you're on patrol in Piner, can you be called all the way to like Galvin Park? You can. So we have the city divide it into nine beats of so like geographically okay. throughout the city. Just and that's the help with like more rapid deployment. So they're not ping ponging all over the city, but frequently they do still ping pong right? for more major calls that you're going to see. Uh, there could be an all call that all officers are going to, but they we try to send them in, and there's four different patrol teams through each week, staggered through our through each day, staggered at different start times. And then they all, each one deploys to those nine different beats throughout the city. And then, uh, so at sometimes you'll have three in one beat, depending upon the stagger time. And then, and we overlap those like on the peak call volume times. And then the, the time number you gave us, the seven minutes and seven seconds, mm -hmm. is that like a average, is that a median? How do you guys calculate that? That's a good question uh, for our crime analyst team that puts that together. And, and I, I believe it is the average time, but I can get more details from our crime analyst team. Yeah, he does, but average. And is right there in. like specific times of day where it's much lower than others? Like, is it really like you can probably count on like a four minute response, but occasionally there's like a 20 minute response? For sure. So, like, our from that, like, one in the afternoon till nine o'clock at night is certainly our peak time. So, those are the ones. And so, that's where we overlap and we have the swing shift team we have a late swing shift and the graveyard team so we that's where we have our highest amount of officers during that time so you certainly see faster response times at four in the morning because there's not as many calls pending and then we're, so we're able to rapidly deploy but when you come in at three in the afternoon uh, i'm sure if we log into the board right now there's 20 to 25 calls like stacked up depending upon and they're lower priority calls uh like that and then Normally, the officer will go to those calls assigned to their beat, but if it's a priority call, they'll come out of their beat to go to an in-progress domestic violence or an in-progress shooting or assault in, uh, on a person like that, that they'll come out of their beat to be able to handle that. Have you guys been able to see like what the effect of having the community service officers is on like pulling some of those patrol offer, like things that they would normally have to do with the community service officers and doing instead, and how much of that is that like a cost saving? Like, are they able to do as many calls as a patrol officer? Like, does it make sense that more? They're the tremendous cost saving. Uh, they're they're cheaper than right. the officer for now. They're a little more limited in the calls that they can go to. Uh, they can't have suspect contacts and things like that. But our, actually, our council saw that this year and added two more for our general fund, added two more field evidence tech positions because they're kind of dual purpose of not only processing all crime scenes, but when they're not processing crime scene, they go to those same calls and handle the, the vehicle collisions and the no suspect have report. So that, that was part of the strategy at a general fund was to add those two positions to help make more officers more available during the priority calls and start reducing some of this. But the CSO position is an incredible position for that. And we're evaluating different things with our CSO position right now, what the future of that position looks like so we can maximize that and have the officers to be able to respond to those priority calls. Thank you. Absolutely. Sorry, I know it's getting super long. I have one last thing. Of course. I forgot to say it. Uh, the part about the measure of funded officers mm -hmm. in the areas I had wrote down, like the country summer event, Santa Rosa Marathon, uh, the certain businesses. I know Metro obviously funds like the whole downtown team, but I was gonna say for what I just recommend and offer is definitely because we know where like the gang violence obviously happens the most at, you know, and obviously that's kind of a lot of the the dreams of the community when they pass this way back when is definitely it would be super nice to hear if those officers that are assigned the areas where we know the most gang violence happens. Because obviously violent, like gang violence can happen anywhere or overall violence, like, but like the country summer event, you know, like it would be great to maybe in the areas where we know the, the gang violence, you know, where gang member, quote unquote, I hate using that word, but I know it's, it's in our fucking, uh, excuse me, sorry. It's in our, it's in, it's in measure O measure mm -hmm. or measure H now, or this new name. It's just that we know where, our, where the people are that are suffering and are involved in these, especially the young people. So I would offer if you could have those individual those officers assigned to those areas to be involved in the community in those areas in positive ways. I know it's it sounds like you're really understaffed and I, I know I hear that. I just want to offer it just as you know, because it's just my duty being here, you know, and from what I've heard from the community, because obviously we have to coexist, you know, and I would definitely offer the officers assigned to the areas where we know 
quote unquote gang members are, it would be great to create a positive uh, experience. Because I know that the, yeah. talk, the talk, taco with a cop, mm -hmm. the coffee with a cop, like those are great. And I've been to those, but the type of people it attracts, you know, it's mostly people that are, you know, you know, they're, they're friendly with friend office. So finding yeah. other ways to get in those specific areas and go into the community as opposed to having them come. So you yeah, yeah, just and offering all that. Yeah, so I, you don't have to respond or anything. Just want to offer. Okay. I strongly agree with that. And one of the things we made a transition with the Taco Cop the first time we did it at Matote, and it was kind of like what you described, the more like the friendly crowd coming to us. Yeah. So the second one we did on Apple Valley in the apartments and did it with those living on Apple Valley and Papago. And like it was it was cooler because we saw hundreds of kids coming and their families and being able to gauge with them. But we've also to, to kind of talk about you going where some of the problems are. We launched a new initiative this year called the Data Led Policing Initiative. And we're, we're doing exactly that now four operational objectives of violence reduction, traffic safety, uh, quality of life, uh, crimes, and community engagement, saying that community engagement is equally as <clears throat> important to me of going out there and making traffic stops. And then we do that. So each month, the officers get where are the community events in your beat. And then they get that. And it's going to talk about whether there be, uh, and Danielle sends us tons of those, and, and Director Tippett's as well, like that sends us tons of those and talk about, oh, at Finley, they're having a big event. So we send that to the beat officers and we say, try to get out there and swing by Finley and say hi and pass out some stickers at whatever's happened at Finley or, or at Howard Park or wherever the event may be. So those are some of the things we're trying to do is gather that data. But at the same time, we're showing where are the peaks in collision, where are the peaks in violence in our community. And each month they get that report for their specific beat saying, be present in this area and be engaged this area that's great is, is that recorded anyway because i'm just offering maybe the next time mm -hmm. if you could provide some of that data of the experiences officers are having because i think that it, it would it would help the conversation i feel like i have to have some of with community members when yeah. i show them the presentation it'd be great to see some yeah of we did capture some of it we just released about probably six weeks or so our annual report for 2022 is 50 pages long and had uh, so if you want to like sit down with a cup of coffee maybe and go through it so, but it had a lot of had a lot of pictures and a lot of information about specifically that about some of the priorities and it listed my eight department priorities and like it had like a little section on each one of those priorities about what we're doing but it had a lot on engagement and not only things that people are doing on duty but things that are doing off duty that we have a lot of officers and civilian members who are involved in different boards and different nonprofits and sports programs and it kind of talked to like what they're doing to be engaged in the community off duty as well and so we we're really proud of that oh great thanks for saying i'm definitely gonna, definitely gonna check that out perfect thank you absolutely okay do, i'm sorry <laughs> uh, do you have to know like what percentage of our officers are actually residents of santa rosa I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. We have looked at it before, and it's something that we really highly encourage. And actually, we've talked with the city before, and I know the city has been exploring of different options toward incentivizing that or looking at different, like, home loans. There's been all kinds of things we've talked about. It comes down to cost, though, which is sometimes uh, easier said than done to be able to get those funds. But we really encourage that. And I live here in the city of Santa Rosa, and, and I really talk when we have applicants coming in about the value, because you get to kind of feel like you're part of the community. Your, your children are going to school here. You're going to the grocery store here in Santa Rosa, and you became invested. Uh, your neighbors love to come over and talk to you about any issues related to policing and speeding cars and things like that. But it's positive that you get to be able to build some of those connections. So I don't have that actual data, but that's something that we could certainly get and report back to the board on that we, we have it available Great. to us. Thank you. Violence prevention. <laughs> 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 okay, <All right>. violence <laughs> prevention. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Jeff Tibbetts, Deputy Director with the Recreation and Parks Department. Um, very excited to start our presentation with a very quick introduction of Dante Watson, our new director, who is on day three uh, here in Santa Rosa. <laughs> Uh, and for our presentation today, I'm uh, I'm going to take a I'll be around for questions or those things, but I'm going to take the back seat today. Uh, Jason Parrish, our ASO, will cover the financial pieces. Danielle Gardunio, our VPP manager, uh, will cover the the story of what VPP has been doing, and then Joanna Moore, our supervisor for neighborhood services. Uh, they're much more connected every day to to what the team is doing out there, so they will share that story today. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jason Parrish. I'm the Administrative Services Officer for Recreation and Parks. And this first slide is a, um, a very positive reflection of uh, the fund balance that we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, starting out at a little bit under half a million dollars and increasing almost to $700,000. What uh, 
this table isn't really showing is that's been a reflection of the amount of change that's taken place within the violence prevention program and neighborhood services over the last year we've had uh, the extension of the cycle 10 choice grants as well as the um, uh, turnover in some of the management positions as well as line positions and they've been picking up the work and moving it forward so um, as you can see uh, we do have that $300,000 gap between our 22 to 23 sales tax revenues uh, and the inspectors. <laughs> and what we're hoping to do is make sure we're putting that out on the street as quickly as we can. Please advance the slide. So overall in our expenditures, as you see the salaries and benefits, um, what that doesn't really show is if you take the salaries and break that number into thirds, what that would reflect is one third is the violence prevention staff uh, doing the community outreach and the strategic planning and the other violence prevention work they do. One third of it is the regular staff in the Recreation and Parks Department uh, who is planning and overseeing and making sure all the field programs in the neighborhoods are taking place. And finally, the third uh, is our seasonal temporary staff. And those are uh, frequently a third of which are former participants uh, within the neighborhood services programs who have come back and are able to give back into the community, uh, helping us with our programs. So you will see the services and supplies and the vast that supports the staff members, but the vast majority of that are the operational needs of the different programs, the violence prevention, being able to have the materials and their pop-ups when they go out to whole community meetings and neighborhood services with all the materials like sports balls and nets and all the other the t-shirts for the kids uh, and finally is the uh, choice grants and in the last implementation plan that the guideline was a third uh, or 30 percent of the uh, violence prevention portion of revenue would go towards choice grants and that is again what violence prevention uh, partnership itself actually administers for our community and their um, total the administration overall it reflects the citywide uh, cost allocation plan for what we do for the committees and finance and human resources and we all appreciate their services so uh, next slide so showing the long-term uh, plus delta between the revenues and expenditures for violence prevention and neighborhood services. Uh, our goals are to make sure that all the resources we have are put directly out into the street as quickly as we can get. What you do see at the very uh, top there is a little tail of those expenditures, and that is simply a fact, factor of uh, staff turnover. And so that will uh, start rising up and get closer to the revenue line again next year. And I believe it's time if you advance the slide. Turn it back over to Joanne Moore. Good afternoon, Joanna Moore, Recreation Supervisor with Neighborhood Services. And I'm fairly new to this position, um, but I'm really excited to be here with you guys today because I'm not new with Neighborhood Services. I um, I've been with Neighborhood Services since 2018, so being able to represent our department, not only as the current supervisor, but also as a coordinator, more boots on the ground, um, is exciting to me. Another reason why I'm excited to be here today and present on um, Neighborhood Services is because this last fiscal year was the first year that we were able to roll out all of our programs again post-pandemic. Um, so that just felt really good to be back out in the community uh, connecting with our community partners and connecting face-to-face um, -face with our youth and the families that we serve. Um, during the pandemic, we did, we stayed very busy and we were able to still connect with our families, but there was some that we didn't see during that time. So it was nice to see them um, come back and re-engage in all the programs that we offer with the neighborhood services. So a quick overview on neighborhood services and what we do. We um, provide programming to the vulnerable population within Santa Rosa, um, primarily at risk, low income, um, homeless, and um, English learners um, families. Also, um, we target priority neighborhoods and we um, figure out those, neighbor those neighborhoods by um, the scorecard that the violence prevention team <clears throat> 
Um, what we do, we provide recreational activities, um, social activities, um, athletics. We have several sports leagues that we do throughout the year. We also provide after school programs and camps, um, enrichment programs, as well as prevention programs. And we do this year round. Um, we do this at different, um, we have relationships or work very closely with um, for school districts within Santa Rosa. We also um, provide programming at different schools throughout the throughout Santa Rosa. We work very closely with um, low income housing, um, uh, Burbank housing, and then we also provide programming at our community center and our parks. And we do this. Um, we like to provide a safe place for all of our youth in our um, in our community. And we like to build relationships with our families and our youth that, youth that we serve. Um, we feel like it's um, it, us building the trust and having that relationship with the youth and the families that we serve. We are able to identify families who might need a little extra support or um, maybe a youth is experiencing some kind of <laughs> mental health crisis or possibly we're able to observe if one of our participants is showing signs that that might be affiliated with the gang. So we're able to, since we have that close relationship with them, we're able to have those conversations with them and then provide them with the resources that they need, working really closely with our violence prevention partnership and their wraparound program. And we're able to hand them off to, um, to Danielle and her team. And it's just a very safe, um, where the, the family and the participant feel safe throughout the process. Um, <clears throat> I strongly feel that youth deserve to have an opportunity to participate in any activity that they would want to. And I wouldn't want anybody not to be able to participate because they don't have a home or the neighborhood that they live in or um, because they don't um, speak English. So that is really where neighborhood services comes in because we're able to provide like no cost, low cost programming um, through our, to our members who part who qualify for our program. So as you can see up on the slide, um, we had a really successful year. Um, we served you know uh, over a thousand youth this past year. We also um, provided over one hundred and fifty thousand service hours throughout the year, um, but putting back on my coordinator hat here, um, for me, what looked the success that I saw this year was those connections, was the um, the growth that I saw with the youth, um, was the, um, the stories that came from us being able to provide these programs and seeing um, the impact that we're making on our community firsthand. Um, so, and I'll get into one of those stories a little bit later. Uh, we break up our um, programs seasonally. Our fall and our spring programs pretty much mirror each other. We provide, uh, we do our cheer program during that time. We do flag football, junior warriors basketball. That's a um, program that came back um, this past year because of um, the county lessened the um, protocols in regards to different sports that can come back and we can pay, play it safely. We also provide um, fall break camp during that time. The way I like to describe our camps to people is that anytime the school is closed, that's when neighborhood services like swoops in and we provide a safe place for our youth to be while the schools are closed. So we provide um, care for our elementary age, um, for our elementary age kids, um, and um, and we also do some some camps with our with our teen kids as well. During our winter um, time, we do a co-ed futsal and a sports clinic. Um, our sports clinic was something that we started during the pandemic, and we were able to continue it um, after the pandemic because it was a really successful program. Um, and then last we lastly we have our summer program. We our Rexen. Recreation Sensation Program is more of like a staple program for our, our summer camps. We provide programming at four different locations or camp at four different locations all throughout the community um, and serve um, at least 120 to 150 um, youth per site. We also, this past year, were able to bring back our Junior Giants program, which was a, a big success. Um, 
one of our participants in that program actually received a scholarship um, for $10,000 through the Junior Giants program. So we had a great, great year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these, this slide kind of talks about the programs that we do year round. So that's our after school program. We partner with Burbank Housing and we do after school programs at eight different locations throughout the city of Santa Rosa. Um, Burbank Housing, um, we have an agreement with them and they also, um, we, they provide um, money for our services and we're able to leverage those the, the, that money and we are all able to use that for um, different programs that we offer. Um, within neighborhood services. Um, so we're able to add an additional recreation specialist because of that. And that also benefits just all of neighborhood services. Um, we do our family fun times, as you can see up there, we have uh, one of our family fun times is our spring fest where the Easter bunny comes out. That's actually me in that bunny suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to like to be the person that dresses up in those um, those costumes. The past Halloween bash, I was Spunky the Squirrel. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be in those costumes because they the kids, I can see so much joy looking out those little eyes and I just like take little pictures in my brain and say, never forget this because there's so much happiness that I get to see. Um, but we also offer um, a Halloween bash. We offer um, blank, blank um, uh, a splash bash. That's kind of like a big program at the end of our summer where we ask, invite all of our participants to come out and come to Ridgeway Aquatic Center and we have a barbecue and they're swimming. Um, and then lastly, I was really happy um, when I saw the increase in memberships from a fiscal year 2021-2022 to um, 2022 to 2023, 38% um, I felt was something that was a big jump in memberships. Um, it was uh, it was really nice to see, and I think that has to, mostly I think that has to do with the fact of us coming back after the pandemic. But also, we really worked closely with marketing this past year, and we identified um, those priority neighborhoods that we wanted to send specific. Um, block blasts, um, which block blasts are an, an informational newsletter about everything that we offer. Um, and I think that that effort really made a difference in our, um, in our membership. Next slide, please. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Danielle Cardunia with the Santa Rosa Violence Prevention Partnership. Um, so jumping into our Work. We did a lot over the last year, and I wanted to just quickly make a note that while we did a lot, we did it with very few staff. Uh, we had a lot of staff turnover uh, over the last year, so we were averaging about four people um, at any given time um, as staff for the partnership. So I just wanted to, to make that note before I jump in. Um, we activated our crisis response team three times in the past year. Our crisis response team is made up of our operational team members. Um, and, and it's there to help provide uh, community healing and support after a critical incident of violence, um, as well as uh, reduce the likelihood of retaliation in the community. Um, and so this is um, uh, where Chief Cregan had mentioned, uh, he or a member of his team will contact me um, if there is a critical incident of violence. Um, once that happens, then we activate the crisis response team. So. The crisis response team was activated on March 1st of this year at Montgomery High School um, due to the incident on campus. Um, our partnership staff links students and families to needed services, including services provided by our Choice Cycle 11 grantees. LifeWorks is able to provide 11 free supportive therapy sessions for students on campus. Uh, Rice's collective provided in-class art activities and an art, uh, or sorry, a lunch art lab um, where student, uh, sorry, on campus, as well as facilitated discussions about cultivate, cultivating and maintaining safety um, for the students who witness the violence directly. Community Matters brought together school staff, administrators, and community members to identify um, the ways to make changes so incidents like this don't happen again. Our staff also participated in several debrief sessions with the district and school administrators and staff and participated in Montgomery High School's uh, school wellness fair in May. 
We also initiated the crisis response team after the June 16th shooting at the Continental Apartments on Corby Avenue and the June 24th shooting in the Bellevue Ranch neighborhood. We hosted a community meeting at Roseland University Prep following <coughs> um, the last shooting um, where we um, engaged about 130 community members and had discussions around community violence. We also worked with Buckaloo programs, 4Cs, LifeWorks, uh, SRPD, and the district attorney's office to assist one of the witnesses of the first shooting in obtaining services, including mental health therapy and relocation assistance. Um, our team also hosted two community wellness pop-ups in response to both shootings. Um, our staff and community partners brought together resources, services, and ice cream to each impacted neighborhood and engaged approximately, approximately 150 residents total from both neighborhoods. Um, we also worked on our life skills program this last year and continued to implement that. Um, we held a 12-week course um, at Roseland Accelerated Middle School, reaching approximately six students. And then we also partnered with our neighborhood services team um, in their teen sports camp um, to reach 24 youth in a shortened version of our 12-week um, program. Uh, just as a reminder, the life uh, skills course offers <coughs> participating students classes in anger management, conflict resolution, and exposure to various violence prevention strategies and activities. Um, each session uh, follows a restorative circle format where youth are provided the opportunity to dialogue with one another about their feelings and experiences, as well as journal and engage in interactive activities centered around a weekly theme. Um, finally, uh, our biggest event of this year, uh, which happened very unexpectedly, we were asked to plan and host the Roseland Cinco de Mayo Festival this year. Um, and in less than two weeks, our staff organized 26 vendors to provide resources, food, and activities for our youth and families in that area. Our neighborhood services team provided kids uh, with an activity area, and we also had four bands that provided entertainment for our attendees. The event ran for about five hours, and we hosted approximately 1,500 community members throughout the duration of the event. So I'll make a note that while the city does not typically um, plan or host this event, doing so this year provided our community with a safe and family-friendly space to celebrate and prevented sideshow activity and incidents of violence from occurring that evening. Um, it was a lot of work, and I'm actually currently on the um, the planning committee for next year's um, next year's event um, as a planning committee member, not the lead. <laughs> um, uh, in the process we're planning for next year. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay. Uh, so, we also continued to implement our Guiding People Successfully program, uh, which we actually leverage funding from Sonoma County Probation um, to uh, fund our wraparound um, coordinator um, and who uh, operates this program. Uh, GPS. Um, provides critical funding for system level improvements to our referral system while also supporting evidence informed prevention and intervention programs, including services such as case management, in home counseling, and classes for parents. Um, this year, or uh, this fiscal year, um, we had a total of 109 or 139 referrals, um, 119 which were non probationary youth referrals, and 20 probation referrals. Um, this is a 43% increase in total referrals um, for all, all youth and a 40% increase in non-probationary youth um, as, as compared to last year. Last year, we only had 60 total um, with 48 non-probationary uh, referrals and uh, 12 probationary youth referrals. Um, this is likely due a, to coming back from the pandemic and everyone's back together in, at school. Um, and there's just a lot of resources and services needed, but also the March 1st <laughs> incident at Montgomery, um, we saw a lot of referrals and um, needs for student support after that as well. Um, and also just a quick note um, about the referral program. Um, most of the non-probationary referrals that we are seeing are directly from Santa Rosa City Schools and the Roseland School District for our middle school and high school aged youth. Um, next slide, please. 
I'll uh, touch on our choice uh, grant program. Um, so starting in July of 2022, uh, we began to implement cycle 11, uh, first year um, of cycle 11. Um, we fund currently fund eight grantees to implement programs under the following three pillars, school readiness, student engagement and truancy prevention, and street outreach and mediation. Um, for this program, uh, we continued uh, what we started in the Choice Cycle 10 um, program um, by using the results based accountability framework for our evaluation efforts. All community partners <clears throat> use specific performance measures to evaluate impact, um, asking um, the following questions How much did we do? How well did we do it? And is anyone better off? Um, we consulted or contracted with consultants um, to help us evaluate all of uh, the data um, and went with applied survey research um, for this process. Um, they helped us develop our cycle 11 evaluation plan and logic model with input from our, um, our staff as well as all of our grantees. And they also have provided technical assistance to our grantees on development of performance measures and evaluation tools. So um, I will briefly go over some of the numbers here. Um, in total, our choice grantees reached 5,858 participants um, through events, workshops, classes, and other programming. This included youth and parents receiving one-on-one -on -one case management services, um, enrolled in programs such as camps, trucks, art projects, um, et cetera. Youth and family members engaged in therapeutic services, students trained to be peer leaders, school staff participating in school-based programming, and adults and youth participating in community-based programs, events, and activities. Uh, we also hosted five Violence Prevention Awareness Series, or BPAS, events uh, over the last year, reaching 878 total participants. There is a lot of data um, in the report. It would take me a long time to go through all of that data. Um, so I encourage you to read through it. We reached quite a few um, quite a few people um, this last year and are continuing to do so um, into year two. Our Choice Mini Grant Program, we brought that back um, this last fiscal year. Um, the, historically, we provide uh, up to $5,000 per application uh, for the Choice Mini Grant Program for violence prevention operational costs. However, due to our current community climate um, around violence, um, particularly gang violence, um, we are shifting um, the, the focus of our mini grant program um, until things stabilize. Um, and so what we're planning to do uh, leading into this new fiscal year is dedicating um, the mini grant funds for crisis response needs. So relocation services, basic needs, um, so on and so forth. Um, so we will to report on that next year and how that is going. And I think that's it. Okay, are there any questions or comments? I have a question about community engagement. Their position was part of? We are no longer part of the Office of Community Engagement. Okay. Um, that Those positions have been moved over to uh, our communications team. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And those have been and continue to be general funded. Yeah. I just came to mind yeah. you were here, so I asked. Um, you know, one thing that I, I just want to make, I, I was writing down the words that people said, and the chief was talking, and, and I just, all of you were talking from violence prevention partnership. Yeah, you, it's all about building relationships, trust, support, communication, resources, and to create a safe environment. And I know it's true for the fire department, too. We haven't had heard from you yet, but I'm sure those same words are used. I think it's a, it's, um, it's a testament for how far we've come as a community to work together in that way, that we use the same words and we place out differently depending on what agency you're with, but you're using the same methods in terms of the, uh, method isn't the right word, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, sort of our, our springboard from the same basis, which I think is just critical. So I, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> okay, so I have some small questions. Uh, the first one is, um, for the hours that you have, does that include uh, volunteer hours or is it just purely employee, employees? Uh, which for the hours for of the youth neighborhood services? services what well, you had the breakdown of the, um, yeah, the amount of hours? Um, for the summer program, did we include the work experience? Uh, yeah, that was included. Okay. And then um, 
for the marketing, you mentioned that you sent out a uh, mailing blast. So as things shift and change, have you had to shift and change where, where you're marketing your programs or is it staying the same? Um, no, we, we just actually went through the process, I, I would say six months ago to a year where we established new um, priority neighborhoods. Um, based off of staff feedback, based off of working with violence prevention and um, and working with the school districts to identify um, qualifying families. And then um, my last Just to add, oh, I sorry. know uh, violence prevention, Danielle is looking at that piece too. Um, so we pulled that from um, the beginning of this uh, cycle 11 for the choice grant. Um, and as we're looking at already starting to plan for cycle 12, yeah. um, that's one of the pieces that we're addressing too in there. Yeah, and um, we're looking at using what planning used for their general plan update, rather, because we're not utilizing the scorecard anymore. Um, so looking at um, other possible methods of identifying those hotspot neighborhoods. So we're looking at using the equity priority communities moving forward. Okay. And then uh, for the reserve encumbrances and projects, what exactly is in that particular bucket of uh, money? Sorry. It says reserve. Uh, for encumbrances and projects. Oh, um, that is more of a accounting annotation. So when we have a project, we are basically obligating the funds. Okay. Uh, and the encumbrances are when we enter into a contract, whether or not it's uh, for professional or for goods, um, then that obligates us legally uh, as part of that contract. So we don't want to count that as money we have to spend. Okay. That's what I thought. I wanted to clarify. And then I think my last question was, can I hire you to come to my events for your <laughs> <laughs> That was all. <No. laughs> that was a question I'll answer. <laughs> Actually, when I was at your no. event, <laughs> I... And I wrapped up my friend so quickly that but the story that I wanted to tell was I ran into a mom at the day and night festival mm -hmm. who came up to me and um, told me she was enrolled in our um, summer camp and um, she was having a very hard time um, uh, behaviorally and would have um, moments where she was breaking down. So I sat with her and I said, you know, what do you do? Like when you're feeling this way, like, you know, how do you work through these big feelings and emotions? And she said that she likes to draw and, and she has nothing. She doesn't have color pencils and mm -hmm. drawing paper at home. So we were able to provide her with um, like a deluxe um, art kit and mom said that she is really utilizing her kit and drawing these beautiful pictures and, um, doing really, really well in school, primarily in our art class. And so um, it's just a, a story of you know, how we're making a big difference in our community. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I had one that just first off, you know, you know, I used to be part of Record Parks before too, so I definitely always appreciate the amazing events y'all are hosting. And I know y'all just had your last basketball tournament the last weekend when we did, so, you know, it's, Always super appreciate that. Uh, I mean, so uh, what I wanted to ask was, is do you all have like the demographics of the youth that are in the program? Do you all collect like race demographics for the people at Reckon Parks programming? So we do not. We've been having some conversation um, around that. Again, some of the good conversations that's happening with BPP and neighborhood services and recreation and parks all coming together. Um, uh, recreation on its own, it's kind of right. I mean, we don't want that to be a barrier, of, you know, and so. But to, to have those conversations with BPP, what are we collecting across the board from our agencies and, and how do we build those uh, same things into it? So it's, the, the answer to the exact question right now is no, yeah. uh, but something that we're certainly having conversations with about is we know that data is really good, but it's also sensitive to collect that data. And so how do you balance those things, right? So our choice funded agencies do collect that information, um, but don't currently report out on it. And so we are going to be requiring that moving forward into year two. Okay. Um, and then we also um, collect that data for uh, the referral program, the Guiding People Successfully program. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I've heard a lot of great things about our program. You know, much big up to y'all team over there. You know, that's great. And, like following up on that, I, I'm glad that it's become, it's starting like that. Cause just, uh, I know that there used to be the, I don't know, I kind of brought it up last time. I know there used to be like a Wrecking Parks office in the Valley Oak apartment complex. 
and I know it closed down a couple years, like quite a bit of years, years ago. And I think there's a obviously there's a large African American population there. And I think if you know, I know I I believe the reason it closed was because the place didn't have like a lift. It was like a what's it called? The, uh, ADA. Yeah. ADA. ADA. Yeah, like the apartment complex wasn't able to host the place. But hopefully, I'm glad that demographics. I definitely think that uh, if we had something in that area. Yeah, would be great. Just, just offering out there, you know. Obviously, that's like construction thing, but but I'm 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 really happy to hear that the demographics will be collected, and then we can see uh, how we can, if any, uh, wide cast it to a much uh, wider audience. And I'm glad to hear that you're prioritizing the marketing connected to the priority areas because I definitely think that's a priority area, and I'm glad to hear that y'all are moving in that direction. So yeah, big ups to y'all for sure. Valley Oak was before my time with Neighborhood Services, okay, but yeah. it does come up in conversation quite a bit about us trying to get back out to that yeah. to that area specifically. Um, okay. so. nice. What is the limiting factor to increasing how you are enrolling these services? Is it like, do we have vacancies? Is it we just need more funding? Or limited factor for participants? Um, so we have like 655 participants in summer, like if, what is something that's about 800? Is it getting more people to sign up? Is it funding? A very complicated question because we can go down the list of programs, right? You have some programs like Junior Warriors Basketball where it's strictly a matter of gym space availability. Okay. Um, certainly budget comes into a factor for all these things. Um, some could be, you know, some areas we're reaching the capacity of interest um, with a program. Um, so yeah, a variety of things from location, funding, uh, staffing resources, a, a growth plan, right? As we, we don't wanna just go out and go for every resource and then have to try to grow to meet that. So having a good sustainable plan to grow along with it. Uh, it's kind of all those factors across the board. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good evening, Chair Minor, members of the committee, Scott Westro, fire chief of the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, with me tonight is our finance analyst, Sarah Roberts, and Sarah will handle our first three slides. Thank you, Chief Westro. Um, the first slide, sorry, can, thank you, Shelly. <laughs> our first uh, slide shows our beginning fund balance at the beginning of the fiscal year for 2022-2023 at $3.8 million. Uh, we had revenues of $4.8 million. Uh, and our expenditures were 4.4, and our encumbrances, as uh, Jason Parrish pointed out, are um, commitments we've already made. So those two commitments are 870,000 for our type one engine. And then we have a remaining balance of 244,000 for our mobile radios. Staff's diligently working to finish getting those installed uh, on our engines. Um, and so we ended our fund balance at the end of the fiscal year with $3 million approximately. Next slide, please. <coughs> The next slide shows uh, just a chart of the breakdown of salaries and benefits, services and supplies, and our administration, and also our um, transfer out, which is our debt service on uh, the former Fire Station 5 site. It's our lease payment. That lease payment will, um, our last one will be due in the summer of 2025, uh, June or July, and I apologize for not knowing the exact month. Um, is when that ends. So our services, um, sorry, our salaries and benefits is approximately 3.5 million and our services and supplies and uh, fixed assets are about 525,000. Next slide, please. Um, and our revenues and expenditures almost uh, mirror the other uh, groups in this <laughs> report. And our revenues are at 4.8 million and our expenditures are at 4.4 million. Um, as ASO Lawrence uh, pointed out, we are heading into contract negotiations, so our revenue, our expenditures may increase, um, and we're not sure of our revenues at this time, but we're hoping they hold steady, um, and we've always run pretty tight ship, so we'll see how that goes. Thanks, sir. Next slide, please. So for the fire department, just like the police department, um, Measure O is very heavy in providing us with um, additional bodies. So uh, in total, we have 10.5 FTEs assigned to the fire department through Measure O. Um, we have three fire captains who are also trained as paramedics, three fire engineers who are trained as paramedics, and three firefighters who are trained as paramedics. And what I'll delineate for you all, and I've talked about before, is it takes nine people to run an engine company. So one engine company, it's three people on three shifts. So it's nice. So Measure O accounts for an entire engine company, and we only have 10 
in the city of Santa Rosa. So um, it equates to 10% of our engine companies. Also our fire captain in charge of our training center um, on West College Avenue. Uh, currently our training captain has a fire academy going on there, um, training uh, four new people that will join the force um, next Thursday. Yeah. Yes, next Thursday. <laughs> um, and then uh, the paramedic positions are important because as we'll show in the next slide, it provides ALS staffing to actually three different engine companies throughout town. Um, it pays for 25% of our EMS or emergency medical services division chief. Uh, emergency medical services or our medical responses are about 65% of what we do on an annual basis. So having that proper management and oversight into that division is very important to us. And then measure also pays the paramedic incentive pay for six firefighters to turn our truck companies, the long ladder trucks into advanced life support or paramedic capable uh, companies. Next slide, please. Some of the impacts from Mejero, um, as we talked about, it covers the nine firefighter positions and the training captain. Um, it's created three of our engines uh, to be ALS and both of our ladder trucks to be ALS or paramedic equipped. Um, it has the, the management and oversight from the EMS division chief position. Um, and really what this does is because it equates to 10% of what our engine firefighting force is, um, it helps us with our response time and the deployment of resources, uh, which <clears throat> reduces fire loss improves uh, EMS patient outcomes and increases our community outreach. As a tag note here, and we'll talk about it more in the next slide, it finances and still continues to finance the construction of Fire Station 5 on Newgate, um, which burned down during the Tubbs fire. Next slide, please. Uh, the fire stations that Measure O has constructed to date, um, Fire Station 10, which is in the southwest uh, corner of Santa Rosa on Corporate Center Parkway, which is where our offices are at, um, was built in 2008 via Measure O. Fire Station 11, which opened in 2009, is on Lewis Road in the Junior College District, was built in 2009. And as we talked about, it uh, built Fire Station 5, which opened in 2016 and burned down in 2017 um, during the Tubbs fire. And next slide, please. The third allocation, for third allocation um, piece that we have, we have people, uh, fire stations, and equipment. On the special equipment, we've uh, purchased two type one fire engines. One's currently on order for Measure O. We expect to see that probably in the next uh, year or so. Um, we currently have nine fire engines in total on order. Um, typically it takes a year and right now we're seeing a three to four year turnaround time on ordering fire engines. It's purchased uh, one type three wildland fire engine, which is on the bottom left there, uh, four command vehicles, one swift water rescue trailer, and then last year, as you all approved, 55 mobile radios that are dual fitted, <coughs> so they can talk on both uh, law enforcement and fire department frequencies and eight mobile repeaters. I'm still trying to figure out how to use my radio. They're so sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling. Um, so that's the special equipment we've purchased. Equipment we've purchased with Measure O. And um, to your your point, uh, Member Bailey, and I know to to previous chair uh, Miner's point is we really want to brand. Um, the equipment that we're purchasing, purchasing with Measure O appropriately. And so we'll be, um, when we get the new engines, we'll certainly be branding it as such. Um, and anything we purchase in the future, we'll be branding it as such. So. And with that, I'll ask for the next slide and turn it over to you for any questions that you may have. So do you have any updates for the station? I have a lot of station updates. <laughs> for the one that burned down. Okay, so Fire Station 5 on Newgate Court in uh, Fountain Grove burned down there during the Tubbs fire. Um, we did a very in-depth analysis, and it's a very long story, now six-year long story. Um, but we essentially decided to move the fire station for a couple different reasons. Um, number one, it was in the wrong location as far as our call matrix goes. It was a... It was the easy button at the time. Um, the city owned the piece of property, but it was too small. It's really in the wrong spot. Um, so we needed to move it for our overall call volume, particularly in the lower part of Fountain Grove on the west side down into the Mendocino Avenue corridor. Um, that's their second due area, but with all the infill housing and the housing that's going in in Mendocino um, and Fountain Grove area, um, we felt it was necessary to move them down the hill further. Um, the second part was this, the lot was just too small for a fire station to be able to leave it alone, even though it's built to wildland urban interface standards, leave it alone and not have it burn down again. So um, to, to reduce that repetition, we picked a, a larger location further down the hill. Um, it's turned into a five-year battle with uh, FEMA where we've actually had to go through with our federal delegates and actually change the Stafford Act, which is what um, governs FEMA. 
um, to include wildfire in all of their, their protections. So it was really focused on Midwest emergencies with hurricanes, floods, and tornadoes. Um, so we really had to change their mind because we couldn't prove to them how we're going to move it out of the floodplain. Well, we want to move it lower. That's better for fire. And they couldn't get around their own policy. So, um, so we did an, we did an official groundbreaking, um, at fire station five, which has actually ended up being funded through HUD through a CDBG DR and mitigation grant. Um, so the funding came through HUD. Um, we did an official groundbreaking mm -hmm. in July ish. It was hot out. It was I remember a very that. hot day in July. Yes. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're just finishing up the permitting process that I drove by there yesterday. There's a uh, cyclone fence around it. So we'll actually start breaking ground here in the next couple months, depending on rain. Um, the goal is to have that fire station open in the summer of 2025. Okay. Is there any other questions or comments? Uh, following up on station five. Um, so I understand what Measure O funds are going towards uh, within the report um, for the line on that says interim fire station dash Fountain Grove. That is paying for an interim station or what, what is, yeah, what are the funds in the line on? It's mislabeled and, and the CFO and I have talked about it. I've talked about it with Sarah. We just need to relabel that. It's not actually for an interim station. It's for the station that burned down. So it should stay safe for Newgate. Um, so it was relabeled. Um, there's there, there's about three different accounts for station five. There's the interim station five, which is the station we're working out of right now on Parker Hill Road. There's the, um, that's called temporary station five. There's the new station five and there's the new gate station five. So um, we'll clean that up and make sure that it reads properly. But uh, the, it shows the debt service that we're currently paying down on the station that burned down. And as Sarah said, it'll be, um, it'll reach the end of its note by July of 25. And for that property um, that it burnt down, is it similar to the library situation where if we were to sell that property, those funds would return to Measure O? No, because the city already owned that piece of property. Um, so we just, we took it over and built a fire station on it. Um, but it's actually, I believe it's a TPW or water piece of property. It's water. Water mm -hmm. piece of property. So, so um, this note was back construction. This note was just construction. Correct. Um, and we're seeing it this year in this report. Um, I don't want to step too far out of the context of this report, but if we're opening the new station in 2025, when will we stop seeing this in this report? <laughs> Uh, July of 25. The debt service? The debt service. Yeah, the final, it's actually April oh, of 2025. But so fiscal year 24 25, which is the next fiscal year, um, is the last payment that will be paid off then. So it actually works perfectly into the opening of the new fire station. Uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to the future looking one for your next budget, but I'm going to reserve those questions for that meeting. <laughs> and my last question has to do with the radios. I know we asked about maintenance, and so we didn't ask for training. <laughs> it's, a, it's a me issue. <laughs> There's 156 other people that work them perfectly. It's a me issue. <laughs> okay. If I'm talking on the radio, something's gone terribly wrong. <laughs> well, now, that's all I have. Is there anything else? I just want to thank all the staff. I know you represent lots of people that work for you, but um, it's always impressive to me how much work you do and what good you bring to the community. And I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, I had one. I was going to ask. Obviously, uh, with the gang convention, I had seen it, I had seen like a fire truck did a. I seen a fire truck in one of the slides for the thing today. Did y'all have like a little? Uh, I did notice that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was actually part of the life skills program. And Gustavo was kind enough to bring me into the first year. And we brought a fire engine out to um, Santa Rosa Middle School. And then we elevated the game in, par in partnership with, um, with Danielle's team to actually bring the life skills team to the fire station. They got to spend time with the crews. And, and, and I got to tell you, it was pretty impressive, you know, they walked in, teenagers, right? You know, they're uninterested, yeah. want to be cool. And within an hour, they were climbing on the fire truck, <laughs> on turnouts, they were smiling. They, had, they, they really had a great time. So it was a very, very positive experience. And during the summer also, I believe the, the teen sports camps got to do the same thing um, at both the fire station and at um, the police department as well. We got a tour um, of the, the 
Yeah, I want to give uh, a lot of credit to our community outreach specialist, Daisy Vergas and um, Krista Butts, who have been working very hard to increase station visits and, and participate in these community events. So that's great. Oh, and yeah, I had, I had written, written down community outreach. I know it was like, so you have someone like employed. There's two, like yes. Title? yes. Oh, wow. Is that what measure? Oh, no. No. Oh, <laughs> No, one's a general fund position and the other is through um, vegetation management grants. So they're actually paid for out of one time funding out of PG&E. Okay. Um, but they're, Chris's job is specifically for a vegetation management, but um, they both team up and do everything together. And, and they're really an amazing team and they're really expanding our outreach. Well, that's great. Well, I definitely commend you all for allowing them to take part in these gang prevention intervention tests because you know, I know like Chair Meyer said, it's all of us working as a team. So. I definitely commend y'all allowing, you know, like the collaboration is just super great to see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any public comment? Is there, no? <laughs> okay, is there a motion on the floor to approve, <clears throat> excuse me, to approve of the annual report? One question, are we approving or are we recommending? You're accepting. Yeah, you're you're accepting it and forwarding it to the council. All right, I move to accept and forward to the council. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do a call? Yes. Yes. Member Atkinson? Member Bailey? Yes. Member Yes. Member Yes. Yes. Okay, we show that it's going to be moving on to city council. Are there any additional um, proceeds, uh, excuse me, <laughs> proceeds, anything for the future agenda that you would like to see? What's the date of the next meeting? We usually don't meet until the spring in April when we bring the uh, proposed budget forward. Mm -hmm. So an, an item I will uh, hopefully be curious about is um, interplay and connectivity should the countywide fire tax um, pass because it also has the same enhancement language um, and so in April I would hope that we could have a conversation about how we're all enhancing and not supplanting. <laughs> okay. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay and um, is there anything else? Okay, we're calling the meeting adjourned at 5.55. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> no. Thank you.